You have a note? Just kidding. It's uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I'm Joe Greer, Pedro Jose Greer, but I grew up in Miami and nobody could pronounce Pedro. So I go by Joe and I have the, uh, the deep distinction and honor to be part of the Roseman family and to be the Dean of the College of Medicine. We came out here with a senior team of six of us from Miami, having the experience of starting the very first new medical school in this millennium and creating one of the most unique, actually the most unique curriculum that had been seen in this country in 100 years. After we started that, we ended up consulting at almost 30 different medical schools around this country. But when the opportunity came up here at Roseman in Las Vegas, in the Southern region of Nevada, where I've had family living here since 1966 and I've been coming out here and they had the same type of problems that we had in Miami. The six of us said, we have an opportunity to do something mission oriented to truly improve the most at risk populations in the region, in the state, in this entire area. And we're doing this in this breakthrough building here today with uh, where we house C, C4K, Cure for the Kids, part of the Roseman family. As you can see, the commitment we have, this is the only regional cancer center for children in the region. <laughs> That's repetitive. <laughs> but what I'd like to do is start off by, and they're here, introducing by picture up here, our senior leadership team. I got a globe going. Before I get to it, our mission is to align students, educators, and community in designing and delivering an inclusive and collaborative environment for innovative learning, healthcare, and research to the point where we've developed what you're going to hear about this evening, a program called Genesis, which is household-centered care, which is the first program in the country. And when we presented in front of the Institute of Medicine at the time, the first program like this in the world that actually mitigates after identifying social determinants of health, looks at the entire household and does this with interdisciplinary team where our students were, are gonna have four years of longitudinal care of an entire family, not just an eight week rotation. They'll have those too. But here they're gonna see the actual progress as a family as a physician sees when they're in their own practice. And this becomes very, very important. Genesis, which you can read right here and Dr. Brewster, who was the architect of this program, will explain to you exactly what it is and how unique it is and how we're gonna be using technology. The physician of the future has to be trained in social determinants of health or they will not be paid. It's called value-based reimbursement. The other reason we need to address the social determinants of health is because if we don't, we're never gonna improve the health of this nation. We're just waiting for them to get sick and doing that. I'm a hepatologist, gastroenterologist by training. And I was recently uh, asked about why is there such a high incidence of admissions with alcoholic liver disease? The problem is not the alcoholic liver disease. That's the consequence. The problem is a worldwide disaster. The problem is we don't have enough behavioral health services to take care of our population. Ann Case from Princeton, the economist, wrote a paper called the... Uh, Deaths of Despair, I'm trying to remember it, where she showed since 2017 an increase in morbidity and mortality in this country. Interestingly, it was led by non-Hispanic males of my generation, baby boomers. And the common social determinant of health that they had, which was leading this country in morbidity and mortality, was they never went beyond a high school education. Because the same cohorts by birthday had the same incidence of the, uh, had the uh, same types of diseases and deaths, but a very low incidence. And the three leading causes of their death were suicide, opioid overdose, and alcoholic liver disease. And as a professional class, we need to not only address the issue of our patient that is right there, but lead in our social accountability, where we as physicians become leaders and our future uh, physicians that we're gonna train. That's why in our educational system, we have Marin Gillis, a European trade philosopher who also happens to be the chair of the Cambridge Consortium for Bioethics. And that's not Cambridge in, in uh, Boston, it's the one in England. 
And why is that important? She leads our uh, faculty affairs and innovation and teaching. And the reason we do that is we do studio design teaching like the MIT Media Lab. And why is that important? Because of the complexities that exist out there, it's no longer about a disease and a therapeutic intervention. She leads in ethics, arts, humanities. Why is that important? Well, if a doctor can't tell a story, they can't make a change. So we need to train them in all these aspects. And the better they are prepared in the humanities and the arts, the more they understand different cultures and the better physician that they can become. At Roseman University, we're gonna produce the healthcare workforce of the future, emphasizing clinical ethics, excellence, ethics, empathy, critical and creative thinking, real world experience, and most importantly, humility. And one of the things we learned at our prior institution was by having our students go into these communities to go into somebody's household, we ended up having the highest rates of empathy in the country in our students, because we know it drops off after the third year. And we were just starting to, to measure humility. These are virtues that allows you to be wise, to have wisdom. And it's been discussed in our literature since the turn of the prior century, if not before. We want to lead the, lead the state and the region in creating these technological strategies to achieve academic excellence and advance the effective and inclusive healthcare systems. Plus, as we've learned with COVID, technology is going to be a major force in the medicine of the future. And here, this is Dr. Luther Brewster. I'm also known as his bodyguard. And Lou will be presenting to you Genesis in a little while. Prior to that is Dr. Cheryl Brewster, who I'm gonna talk a little bit about what she's doing just in a second. Dr. Karen Esposito, who's our Senior Executive Dean for Academic and Student Affairs, who uh, to her distinction has climbed the Alps. She's uh, one of our foreign born, but we love her anyways. She came from what's that? It's called Europe. Yes, okay, I've heard of that. And uh, first generation college, Phi Beta Kappa, PhD in biochemistry, psychiatrist AOA, ran one of the largest uh, mental health units in the country at uh, Jackson Memorial Hospital, started the very first FQHC based psychiatry residency program for outpatient psychiatry. Almost all the residency programs are training in hospitals and the problems exist outside the hospital. She was the head of OME at our prior institution and then became the head of student affairs. Let me tell you how important that was. When you open a new medical school, the kid that gets into Stanford is not gonna give up that position. 70% of the students that we had at our prior institution only got into our institution. 30 to 35% were first generation college. 50 to 55% were African-American and Hispanic. Every single graduating class that we had when we were there had the highest step scores, one, two, and three, the highest pass rate and the highest match rate even to the point which is against what we're trying to do as primary doctors, but they had 100% match in ophthalmology. No other school had that. In orthopedic surgery, in urology, you know, and you can't blame a kid that's the first generation to go to college and now has an opportunity to pay back their debts, to create wealth, not Bill Gates wealth, but create wealth by maybe owning a home one day or having the ability to pay for their kid's college. In Nevada, less than 500 students a year apply to medical school. We have Dr. Bruce Morgenstern from the, is that, do I get it correct? The world famous Mayo Clinic, okay? And a, a, a leading academician in our country, a respected author and knows more about clerkships than anybody else would ever wanna know. He's actually the editor of the book. Christina Conley, who is actually, we all work for her. She's our Senior Executive Dean for Finance and Operations. Jamie Faircloth, who is, let me put it to you this way. She's got the only kid in the world that cleans up after himself, okay? She also led the evaluation of the largest uh, grant from the National Institutes of Education in the country. And she has the distinction of being the only member of our team that's a Mensa member. 
and is currently, if I'm not mistaken, vice president of Mensa here in Nevada, right? Or is it Las Vegas? Well, okay. Every time she leaves the room, the IQ goes down. It's really embarrassing. <laughs> and Vicki, and everybody knows Vicki. Vicki has been phenomenal. First and foremost, she's a nurse, which means she's a true advocate for the patient. Secondly, she was the CEO of a hospital, so she knows how to deal with doctors, right? Am I correct with that? And you still have a good liver. <laughs> oh. And I wanna talk a little bit about the program that Cheryl is leading. She's our Senior Executive Dean for Diversity, Inclusion and Equity. We consider that one of the most important things being that underrepresented minorities like most of us here traditionally do not go to medical school in this country. And so we are so mission-based and it's about social justice. And it wasn't just the nuns beating me up when I was little, but the changes that we have to make in this country, we have a social justice wall at the medical school that I'd love you all to visit. But Cheryl's also in charge of our pipeline. At our prior institution, she ran a two and a half million dollar grant stars about getting kids from uh, historically black colleges and universities into medical school with incredible success. And she's here with Erica today because we all need your push. We're applying for a, code, a grant written together because we wanna go from elementary school to medical school. We need more than 500 students applying a year. We need to populate the city with, uh, with physicians, the state, the county. We need to get first gen students in college. Why is that? They tend to come back. As we're trying to catch up with GME, they'll tend to come back. And one of our main things is, as I said in the video, we're not community engaged. We are community dependent. We're gonna depend on those of all reaches of life to the point that the households will be in and they will be uninsured, some will be undocumented, will be the teachers to our students. And the ones that the students vote as the best teacher during commencement, I would like to have Dr. Kaufman present them with the Medal of Teaching, as well as a faculty appointment. If they're teaching our students, they deserve to have that too. You don't just need to have a title behind your name. 70 to 80% of all diseases in this country, 70 to 80% have a non-biologic cause. The endemic we have with diabetes is not caused by a biological disorder. It's a biological disorder that's caused by poverty, lack of exercise, inappropriate diets, all the different things that go along with it, which then gives you liver disease for metabolic syndrome, as well as heart disease and renal failure and everything else you can imagine. Imagine if we could stop that up front. And how do we do that? Well, we need people from dis different, th different disciplines to see how we educate our students to develop the best delivery systems and the best technology. And it can't just be MDs because the diversity of our team is just not in ethnicity and race and gender, but it's in terminal degrees. Lou, Cheryl did their postdocs at the University of London. Lou went from nutrition to public health. He, everybody on this team has so many more degrees than I will ever have. So what I've decided to do since I'm Cuban Irish and I'm gonna use all my last names, <laughs> slash Medina, Martinez, Jimenez, and then that way I can get as many letters as they do. And, uh, but how do we address these problems? Lou worked for many years for John Lewis, was in the private industry in economic and uh, community development in Harlem, Detroit, Atlanta. Was on faculty at the University of Michigan, came down, was founding faculty for our School of Public Health and founding faculty for our School of Medicine. And when Lou came on, and the very first time I met Lou, I didn't realize how tall he was. But Lou is this brilliant individual that can take care of things from 30,000 feet above the sea level to on the ground. Don't ever give a Cuban water. I'll be like a Southern preacher. I'll never shut up. And so with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Lou. So he can describe to you our flagship program next to Aspire, which is also known as Aspira, 
about Genesis. Good evening, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to talk to you about uh, labor of love, a passion of mine, which is um, basically um, Genesis, uh, sadly, should not need to exist, right? Um, Genesis should already be something that is built into uh, the fabric of our healthcare system, the fabric of our medical education system, but sadly it is not. And so um, we have ambition to provide it um, to society in, in its absence. And so that being said, um, I'm going to kind of give a little context to why um, something like Genesis needs to exist. So I remember when I first met Dr. Greer, um, I thought he was crazy and then I found out he really was. Um, and so when I met him, uh, he uh, said a lot of things, but the one thing that stuck with me was, he said, you know, I think it's criminal that uh, a medical student can train in public hospitals um, learn uh, from poor patients, uh, do some uh, uh, do procedures on poor patients, and then graduate, go make a decent amount of money or a lot of money, and then reject or refuse to accept um, the insurance for the poor. <clears throat> and I, I, that kind of stuck with me because I was like, well, there's a couple of things built into that. One is one is how does that happen? How do we, one, um, train individuals, uh, have them work with poor individuals every day, and somehow, some way, walk away from them later on? What have we done to them? What have we placed in them that they feel comfortable to do that? The second is, is what kind of system have we designed that enable for that to happen, um, where an individual can walk away, uh, um, absence of any consequence, uh, and we continue to have that system, uh, um, with, uh, with quite comfort, to be honest. And so um, an investigation of that kind of led us to also seeing a third thing in that, which is what is it about, um, uh, what is it that we can do to uh, empower patients so that they can demand more, um, not only from the, the doctors that care for them, but the system that, is, that they, re they rely on to provide them high quality care. And so Genesis is about a couple of things. Genesis is one about reducing the distance between providers and consumers. So I spoke to how is it that a, a medical student can leave and, and, and just sort of turn their back on the individuals they cared for? Well, there's a certain distance that exists between a medical student and the, and the life that they grew up in and the way in which they live their lives that makes it almost um, uh, impossible for them to understand the realities of the patients that they care for oftentimes. And so by performing home visits, by requiring students from these backgrounds to go into the homes of medically underserved and low-income populations, you reduce that distance. You now say you have a shared investment in the outcomes that go on in that household. I always talk about the story about um, when we did our work in South Florida about roaches. Follow me. This goes, this ends good, I promise. Um, and, and what it is, is, is that uh, when you are in an office setting as a, a provider and you ask a patient if there is an infestation in their home uh, and they say yes, you get to tick a box and move on to the next question. But when you do a home visit to a person who has an infestation, uh, you are sitting in that infestation. And, and miraculously, you're a little more motivated to get that problem fixed when you are um, alerted to the fact that you will be back in that home in another month. And so you're inspired all of a sudden to find a solution for this infestation that you were so comfortably able to tick a box on when you saw them in the office. And so home visits is a core component to reducing the distance, but it's also about being able to do a thorough health and social assessment. And so that's the first box that you'll see in this diagram is it is, it is important to know how social and medical collide. And what better place to do that than in a person's home where they spend most of their um, non-working life. And so if you see that infestation, you not only see it as a burden on that household, but you see how it compromises those things that you prescribe as um, interventions, medical interventions to deal with their particular health conditions. We have a very unique way of looking at that. We have 
um, spent about eight years designing a um, platform, a technology platform that will longitudinally track the social and medical conditions, not only of one patient, but of the entire household, looking both at the patient level and the household level. You say, well, why is that important? It's important because most health decisions and social are a outcome of a negotiation that occurs in the household, right? And so if you tell an individual that they need to get a prescribed medication, that is a financial negotiation. If you tell an individual they should eat healthy and exercise, that is a time negotiation and a financial negotiation. All of those things are centered around the household. And so this platform that we've designed allows us to track social like you would track blood pressure. I'm always amazed at how um, we will ask an individual who uh, comes for care one time if they are employed, one time if they have adequate housing, one time if they have the ability to, to get to um, uh, the doctor's appointment, et cetera. But we take their blood pressure every time they come to the office. So we track the medical, but we have no investment in tracking the social. Well, we do it different. We track longitudinally on a monthly basis, both the medical and social, and then we intervene like you would intervene if, if an individual was diagnosed with hypertension. Then we create tailored care plans. That's our next bu um, bubble, uh, hexagon. And so um, we intervene by creating tailored care plans. Everything in technology now is about tailored approaches. We need to get on board in healthcare. We need to get on board when it comes to medical education. The delivering tailored approaches that will customize the care that you're providing, not only to the individual, but to their household needs and their social needs. We also leverage as specialists, our trusted community partners. In any industry of medicine, there are specialists and there are primary care providers. We use um, outreach workers as primary care providers for the social needs that households have. Lay health workers who can go out armed with the platform that I mentioned earlier, armed with the workflows built into that platform to know exactly what it is that they should do in the event that they find a social risk. In tandem with that, however, there are some risks that that lay health work worker is not equipped to handle. And that's when you send them to those brilliant community organizations who've been doing this work for, for decades without, quite honestly, the praise that they deserve. They have expertise in workforce development. They have expertise in getting into that individual transportation. They have expertise in getting that individual adequate and healthy food. Why aren't we using them for the specialists that they are? We do that. And that's built into what we do as, as our workflows, not only in the care of um, households, but also in the way in which we educate our students. And then we move to an integrated health, health service model. That integrated health service model is, we coordinate with our medical group, Roseman Medical Group. And what'll happen is, is that not only will you get this type of care when, you, when we go to your home, but when you arrive at one of our brick and mortar sites, you will receive the same level of care, you will have the same attention to both your social and medical, and, and that's the way it should be, right? There should be continuity between what you experience in your home and what you experience when you go to the brick and mortar. To, once again, common sense things, unfortunately, it's not, natural in our healthcare system currently. And then through this whole process, we plan to be the education for tomorrow's healthcare. Our students will be the most prepared students to care for the medically underserved and low-income populations in this nation, specifically in this region and in the city of Las Vegas. And that is, that is the commitment that we have. And I think through this strategy that I've laid out, that is what, um, that, that plan will naturally uh, result. So as was mentioned earlier, what exactly is Genesis? So Genesis is three things. It is an experiential interprofessional medical curriculum. It's a healthcare delivery approach, and it's a population health strategy. And so I'm going to talk, talk just briefly about how it does each one of those three things. So one of the things we plan to do uniquely from the educational curriculum side is we plan to organize our medical students into practice groups. So typically these are learning communities at other medical schools and we'll still have all of the activities that a traditional um, learning community will have. However, we will ratchet that up a bit by turning these into medical practices. 
but not traditional medical practices, because we're about education for the future of healthcare, right? And so these practices will be interprofessional practices. So in, in, included in these practice groups will be College of Nursing students, College of Pharmacy students, College of Dentistry students, who are all, work, all working to get together, not only to perform the home visits, but to look at the data that results from those home visits to look at these um, households and these patients in a population level view. So imagine that, imagine the power of the student being able to look not only at the household that they work with, but also look at all of the households that have been assigned to the practice group that they are a member of. And so they will also have the opportunity to launch telemedicine. Um, so as they headquarter out of our Res Roseman Medical Group, they'll be able to provide telemedicine services to these households, be trained on telemedicine in the appropriate way that blends both social and medical at the same time. We will also do high level social and medical data analytics because as we collect and build larger data sets, then we can get into the more predictive analytics that once again, healthcare is moving towards. Why are we waiting till students get out into the field to learn about analytics when we can leverage this unique experience that we have with our students to provide them that expertise before they graduate and go on to their residencies? Value-based strategies. Um, so I mentioned earlier that um, we want to organize them in this, but we don't want them to just look at data. We don't want them to just learn about data. We actually want them to act on it. And so one of the things that um, my colleague, uh, Karen Esposito, um, was mentioned earlier, uh, talked about is the ability to take and translate this data, right? Remember now, this is, the, this is just a screenshot view of the platform that they will be using. And so you'll notice here um, that there's a household level uh, risk meter as well as a patient or individual level meter. And this is literally how it will look. It will have the picture of the patient. It will have what household they belong to. The students will be able to see the other individuals in that household and the other households that they are assigned to in their practice group. This is the healthcare of the future. This is the way you train students in the future. And that's what we are doing now, future now. And so um, you'll see at the bottom that there's the ability to prescribe different care plans, um, look at them, track their trends over time. Um, but then imagine taking this to both, both not only the individual level, but having our whole practice of students being able to see this at the practice level with all of the households that have been assigned to their group. And then taking that information and coming up with in tandem and in partnership and in being mentored and informed by their faculty on what kind of strategies can we come up with that could head this off, not one household at a time, but in a value-based way where we can implement some of the evidence-based strategies that have been um, tried and accepted. Um, and so this is one example. My practice is working on remote monitoring solutions for many household members with hypertension. And so we envision a, way, a day when students will um, pitch these ideas to a committee that will decide whether or not this is the most appropriate course of action based on whether or not they have analyzed the data that they were looking at appropriately, whether or not they have done a deep dive on the literature related to this particular um, condition, and if it is in line with the best practices as it relates to um, healthcare today. And so this is the exciting work that our students will be able to do above and beyond what other schools are, are able to pro provide for their, their students. And so we're also a healthcare delivery model. Beyond just being um, the teachers of the future, it's very important that we are able to demonstrate to students that what we're doing is not pie in the sky, that it's not this, you know, uh, make-believe world of healthcare. They need to be able to see us modeling this out in the real world and, and creating value for real-life customers, healthcare providers, and systems. And so this is the second leg of what we, we are committed to, is translating this household-centered care approach to one that um, provides value to healthcare systems. And so what does that look like? First and foremost, we're gonna leverage the infrastructure that we inherited, which is the Roseman Medical Group. And we plan to make Roseman Medical Group the elite provider of primary care in the area. And, one, and, and based on all of the things that I've mentioned previously in the way in which we um, deliver our care. And then that will be one of the hubs for headquartering the clinical aspect of our practice groups with our students. All of this will be powered, like I said previously, by the platform that we'll be using um, to uh, manage both 
social and medical risk. We will launch or extend the care, um, not only with students, but we will also launch and extend care using nurse practitioners. And so what that will look like is, is that we'll have a limited number of, of students that we can uh, perform home visits with. But if we combine that with nurse practitioners, now we can scale the number of households that we can provide services to in um, response to the needs of local healthcare providers and healthcare partners. And so this is just an example of uh, the way in which we could triage households and, uh, and appropriately assign um, a combination of both the, health, the nurse practitioner and a lay health worker to go out and deal with basic needs, working in tandem always with the primary care physician at the brick and mortar. And then the last thing is we're, we're a population health strategy. And so this is where things get really, really fun, all right? Because this is where we're able to now take and through an amalgamation of all the things that I just mentioned along with the data sets that we will, the new data sets that we will be creating, we can now target working with the population, the most high risk populations, the ones that sadly in many systems are written off as just cost of doing business. We, we see them as our main target audience, the uninsured, the undocumented, the medically underserved, Native American populations, rural and urban um, high risk populations. And what we see is, is an opportunity to scale through using technology, handheld devices, mobile devices, um, laptops, et cetera, to be able to reach these households in a unique way, giving them a user interface where they can begin to monitor and track their own challenges and learn how to do that through the platform as well. And then the, 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 the other ambition we have that we're working on is the Genesis Zone. And what this will look like is, is this will be a partnership with the Innovation District here locally. They are in the process of launching a Wi-Fi mesh system that will provide free Wi-Fi access to a catchment area in a high-risk neighborhood in downtown Las Vegas. Our goal is to layer our platform on top of that Wi-Fi mesh system, launch home visits and technology to all of the homes in that Wi-Fi, in that Genesis zone, and then um, begin to connect them to one another. So think about this. We'll connect them to our student practice groups, we'll connect them to one another, whether it be based on their um, shared risk, shared disease state, um, we could have um, virtual uh, um, support groups. There's any number of other things that we can do once we have a system where we can connect people um, seamlessly uh, within a catchment area. When I began training, I share this um, oftentimes, when I began training uh, in public health, there was only one community that I needed to be concerned with. And that was the offline community. That was the community that I could see, feel, and touch. And that's the community that people um, commonly uh, see social workers working with, right? You see the, the old image of the social worker walking the street, knocking on the door, caring for the person in the house. Well, there's a new community that I am now charged to care for, and that is the online community. I do no longer have the luxury to only care for the offline community. And, and, and making that even more difficult or complex is the fact that I now have to manage them, the interplay between the two communities. I always use the example of schools. Schools learn this uh, firsthand, the, the, the challenges of managing both the online and offline community. Ask any principal about the school fight that occurred because two kids online um, had a disagreement and all of a sudden out of nowhere to them, <clears throat> there was a fight, right? Uh, well, the same thing happens uh, when it comes to health, right? Uh, five individuals on Facebook all of a sudden have a conversation about uh, vaccination, um, and all of a sudden, uh, vaccination rates just kind of go this way over time because of a trend that has emerged online. We plan to institute a thing we call social media, where we will try to get students to become more nuanced, more activated in playing a role in this interplay between online and offline communities, learning how complex that is, just as complex, if probably more complex than the challenges that they will greet when they go out into communities in the offline space. And, but this Genesis Zone will allow them a unique opportunity to do that with a level of support that they most likely would not have otherwise. Last thing I wanna talk about, <clears throat> which is complementary to this online offline discussion is that 
we can no longer only convene in the offline space like we are right now. This, this whole presentation was uh, a combination of offline, talking to individu uh, individuals in, in real time, and online, talking to individuals over Zoom. And so we, are launched, we have launched a podcast called um, No Laughing Matter with Cuba Pete. And uh, this will be a ongoing discussion about all the ways that we can interface and integrate um, lessons from tremendous leaders in all walks of life um, and how we can take those lessons learned and add them to creating the next um, best uh, incredible medical school here in Las Vegas. And so uh, I will kind of leave it there. Um, thank you very much for the time. And uh, I look forward to all of you participating uh, with Genesis in some way or somehow. Um, our uh, um, biggest thing that we're, we're looking for by way of support is what we're calling the Genesis Forward Fund. It is a fund that we're building to uh, pay for the um, gap um, cost associated with providing services to the population that I, I, I said we would target. Sadly, um, when it comes to uh, the funds needed to care for the uninsured and the underinsured and the, um, and the, and the rural uh, populations, uh, we never have, uh, where there's always this gap between where health insurance or social safety net um, will uh, support and what they actually need. And so that's what the Genesis Forward Fund is about. And if you're looking for a uh, direct way to get involved immediately, that's your um, best avenue. Thank you very much. I think we're, we're gonna open up for, uh, for questions. Also, if you'd like the name, the school named after you, we have that option available too. So I, I don't want you to forget that part. <laughs> the uh, uh, genesis.roseman.edu to get to the, uh, see what's going on with Genesis. And if you wanna see about the platform, it's humble, hmblhealth.com. And you can see how the platform works. We, we came here to be part of this community and now we are part of this community. We've been here seven months. My wife is truly thrilled. She really is. She loves it out here. She keeps texting me every single place I have to visit around the area. And uh, the nicest thing is you guys don't have hurricanes. <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, uh, and it snowed one day. That's, you know, I mean, for a family that went north to Miami, that's pretty, pretty interesting thing to see. Um, what we're trying to do, because Coming out here, one of the other great advantages of Las Vegas is we're not weighed down by the anchors of tradition of the East and West Coast. You have a sense out here that we can do things and make it better for this country. We'd like to be a part of that with you. We moved our entire families out here at this part in our career where we were very comfortable because we found an opportunity in an institution like Roseman that is innovative, cutting edge, the minimal bureaucracy, and I find minimal of any politics at this uh, university, which is a very unusual thing to say. And I'm prepared for politics. I'm Cuban, I'm Irish, I'm Catholic, I'm a doctor, I'm an academic, for God's sakes, what, what else prepares you for politics? And I don't have to use it, <laughs> but we wanna be a part of what you're doing. We'd love you to be a part of what we're doing. We're collaborating not only with communities and organizations, but today we had a great Zoom call with the Dean of the UNLV College of Law, a school that has done fantastically, I might add. We've met with almost all their deans, including Mark Kahn, who we knew prior to coming out here. We've gone out and visit. Cheryl has been at uh, College of Southern Nevada and Nevada State, where we wanna to hope to develop that pipeline. And the pipeline extends not just to come in, but under Marin, we want to do faculty development. Any, fac any facility we're going to be working with, we have to develop those physicians to be able to evaluate the, the students in the proper way. We want to do that. She's one of the leading experts in bioethics in the country, in the world. Well, you got that European gig going. And uh, we want this to be the center of bioethics. We are really ambitious. We're incredibly mission oriented, especially towards social justice. And we do that by looking for excellence. 
And the words that define us are humility, excellence, and respect. And interestingly, the acronym spells her. And we're willing to do what it needs to take to make this happen here. And so with that, I'll leave it for questions. Anybody have any questions? In the audience, online, anything? Sally. And so, <laughs> but you know, uh, and by the way, I feel like the gym is full, but it's real. So I really feel like I can get back to it. So it's Vegas Chamber, who, by the way, was a big part of the UCW Pro Event. And he was a My job is to partner with you how I connect with people. So uh, I just want to make a conversation. Uh, two of your non talkers are making a little notes about <laughs> Yes. Well, we're, we're not trying to make people better at poverty, nor are we striving to be poor ourselves. We're striving to bring people up. The opportunities that were given to our parents that were then given to us. It is an irony, by the way, but I'm not, I'm not moving. <laughs> Marin. Yeah, Marin, hold on a second. Let's get what? Could you repeat the uh, question? The question was: the right and the left side of the brains have different functions. One is analytic. One is more towards the humanities and the arts. And how do you marry those two in education? And, and before Marin answers that, we came across the same problem with social versus medical problems. Society handles social problems as a family, SNAP, TANF, things of that nature. We as physicians handle things as an individual, a disease state. So now all of a sudden you have a discrepancy here. And it was Lou who was able to put those both together. And so, yes, it can be done, but I'm going to let Marin now answer the question. Well, I mean, I could talk about this all day, <laughs> but um, uh, usually when folks talk, you know, we bring that up and that's a very common way of thinking. So we have colleges of arts and we have colleges of sciences and we don't have folks. When we talk about interprofessional education and medicine, we usually talk about everybody in the health professions, not other folks, but lots of different places around the country. And we did it amazingly in the last place we came from. And I actually also had a start at it in the University of Nevada School of Medicine, which I was at previously, is incorporating folks who had come from different disciplinary backgrounds um, to help our students become better clinicians. So first of all, I want more transdisciplinariness, not just interprofessional. But second of all, conceptually, arts and sciences are the, you know, the ethics or the science or the arts and the sciences. In the literature, it's called the two solitudes when we think of that and like, how do we bring them together? Because we think of them as so completely opposite. And as I said, this is a long thing, but all I'll say is when I teach, um, and it was Dr. Greer in my last job who said we had to have ethics first. And so the medical students got ethics first. And I said, you know, when you doing good medicine isn't different from ethical medicine. It's not like you do medicine and then you just sprinkle ethics on top of it. If you're doing good medicine, it is ethical medicine. You know, and my job is to articulate what the values are. But when you talk about what do we go into medicine for, every single person will say it's to help people. That's a value. Right. And also, we have to look at how uh, pre medical education has changed over the time when I was in college, where in our, I went to a uh, land grant school. So we had the state uh, or the uh, university college, which was your first two years where you were inundated with the liberal arts, history, literature, philosophy. Nowadays, kids will come out with a purely scientific degree and they're great at memorizing. But when you learn the liberal arts, you learn critical thinking. We also are gonna be teaching creative thinking because 
the way I see medicine coming down in the next decade or so, or even longer, is it's going to be a huge change. COVID has accelerated that change in both a systems, clinical is clinical. I mean, the liver's a liver. Got eight segments, we're really happy. The, uh, but the, uh, the, what affects the liver and what the liver can affect? And what are the customs of certain ethnicities and races? And how do you deal with that? And so these are all the complex issues that our students are gonna have to deal with that they were not prepared for in their undergraduate degree. And so it was like my daughter in high school gets recruited by Stanford. I was on a board out in California at the Rand Corporation and one of the board members was at Stanford. I said, oh, I said, are you recruiting her for football? I've never seen anything like this in my life. We live in Miami. He goes, no, no, we're recruiting minorities. And I said, well, her minority status is she's been to private school her entire life. She, got two, she has two parents with graduate degrees. She has been given a great advantage. And so, and I'm very proud of her. She uh, ended up at an Ivy League law school, does public interest law, so I could support her the rest of my life. So it works out really nice. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I married way up, and I know that. 40 years of marriage, and my wife still thinks I have earning potential. I think it works out pretty well. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Oh, hold on. Let me get you a uh, microphone. Oh, that's here. Just use oh, I can repeat the question, and then we'll give you oh, here. We got one. Dr. Creer, and to your entire team, I want to thank you with all my heart for coming to Las Vegas. Oh, thank you. I think we have some really amazing schools now with uh, Turo and, of course, with um, UNLV Medical School. Uh, well, congratulations to them for getting full accreditation. Full accreditation. Week. And I can't wait for our day, your day, to celebrate the same thing. So I want to just, I'm very grateful. I think that you're going to add the most unique uh, new medical school that will indeed encompass not just a good academic career, but as you said so well in both your presentations, uh, helping them with their ethics, helping them understand social determinants, which as we shared in our meetings before, without all of these things in the future, healthcare will fall flat. And unfortunately, in a world where the disparity you know, is growing between the very rich and the very poor, and this is not going to just disappear, it's only getting bigger and worse. And there's never been a time we need to address this more. So you are going to be the medical school of the future. So my question is though, talking about the early future of your medical school, since we don't plan to open till 2024, and I calculated that a couple of times, that's like three years. And so, um, uh, what is happening in the meantime? How can we help in the meantime? Well, we're going to launch Genesis hopefully this summer with 100 households in 100 days. So we'll be. Oh, I, I got to turn it off. Yeah. I, I'm Cuban Irish. You don't, you know. Okay. The uh, is we want to launch this this summer. We want to make a contribution. We want to be part of the solutions here. We don't want to be part of the problem. So we're going to start off with that. And we already have students, nursing students, nurse practitioner students, dental students, pharmacy students. So those students will be part of these rotations because it's, it's going to be interprofessional education. So that's what we're going to start off doing. And we have the RMG group, too. So we're doing that. And we're also planning on working with medicines and volunteer. And you realize you have a faculty position. Yeah. <laughs> Even if it's just coming in and just talking about what you do and how you do it, students need that motivation. Students need to know that. And, you know, as you were saying about living in Summerlin and all that, I, I come from two cultures that are car fanatics, Cubans and Americans. So what I tell them is, you want to be a specialist? You want to drive a Porsche? You can get to these communities quicker. <laughs> so... so so go ahead and do that. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Thank you. 
we're we're so excited to be here. You don't know. We really are. And plus, let me tell you, this is a great foodie town. It really, really is. And I'm a non-purging bulimic, so that's not a good thing. Well, thank you Erica. so much. That's uh, similar to what my question was going to be around. I know you all have done your due diligence and really gotten to know our community. Would love to know what you feel is most hopeful about the community that we have here when it I, comes I, to the work. I, I, we, we have been so impressed with everybody we have met by their mission, by their dedication to what they're doing at all segments of the society here. What you're doing with Lit, it just blew me away. It really did, including the fact that you had a University of Florida flag there. I'm, I'm a Gator, okay? <laughs> the, uh, and the fact that you're stimulating these kids. My father's the first one on, on his side of the family that finished high school, much less go to college, went to college. And he got to go up to uh, Boston and see his granddaughter graduate from Harvard. And so this is a man from a little village called Los Arroyos de Mantua and Pinar del Rio in Cuba, a very rural, rural area. And to be able to, to witness that, because one person went to college, one person was able to sit there and do that. One person was able to acquire wealth and his wealth was not millions and millions of dollars, but he owned a couple homes. He paid for our education. He gave us the opportunity to be able to do that. And when we're doing this, we're not going to, I don't want to be measured on how many blood pressures I can control, but how many families we get to resilience, how many families have these opportunities? Because then as we go to these households, I'd like those households to be part of our pipeline. And that's how, that's how it works. But if you go into these households without students and faculty that look like them or have the same accent, they aren't going to believe they can do it. But imagine going in there with nurses, nurse practitioners, dentists, pharmacists, and that kid in that household all of a sudden says, wow, I can do that, but I have options. They always told me I couldn't be a doctor. They told me I couldn't be a nurse. They told me I couldn't do this. And it happens. At our last institution, it got to the point where our medical students came to us and said, oh, the parents want us to tutor their kids. And we said, okay, what happens during your surgical clerkship? What happens when you do an externship? So you know what they did? They went to the School of Education and they got education students to do it. We've been making relationships with the three public universities here. And we want to really do that. Our goal is to make this region healthier and better. I really meant that when I said, what happens at Roseman, what happens in Vegas, I want the world to know. I want the world to know what great folks we get to work with, what a great community this is, and how we can offer hope to other places. I want people to come to Vegas, not just to gamble, they can gamble, but I want them also to see how progressive the city is, progressive in the sense of making it better. And so, you know, that's, that's the reason we came out here. Yes, sir. I will say for Karen that we will keep blood pressure controlled. Yeah, no, no. For Karen, our, our, our biochemist. Yeah, listen, Karen, listen, Karen was very We're doing nervous. all the basic sciences, yes. I promise you. Blood pressures will be controlled. They will be controlled. <laughs> that's not the only measure. <laughs> we have a, a question online um, and a comment. I'll do the question first, and this probably goes more for Lou. How do you plan to address household and center care in the time of COVID? One of the things that we um, learned in South Florida was that um, one of the, the shortcomings of our health system is our inability to identify individuals at risk um, before we need to. And so um, one of the strategic advantages we had in, in, um, in our previous uh, location was that when COVID happened, uh, we were able to identify households uh, that had specific risk, social risk, medical risk, et cetera, and launch teams to them and provide services to them rapidly and, and know exactly what types of services we needed to provide. This is important because um, sadly, we're unable to work on the ground as a healthcare system like we need to. You know, we're trying, we're, think about what we're battling with right now. We can't get people to get vaccinated. We can't get individuals to get tested. 
These are on the ground type of activities. These are not clinic-based activities. This is about the convergence of health education, the convergence of addressing the social determinants of health because individuals are not working. Individuals are worried about their bills. Individuals are worried about you know, um, uh, how they were going to continue to get accurate information uh, while being separate from the uh, people that they've come to rely on, whether it be their healthcare provider or those key individuals in their lives that provide them health information. And so one of the, this is where I talked about this high touch, high tech um, approach about the offline, online integration um, and working in both communities. It's about one, identifying individuals and triaging them based off their risk and then also triaging them based off of their capacity to gain information and resource and services in an online platform. But that won't work for everyone. And in those cases, if you can trim down the number of individuals who need the high touch services, meaning you need to go to their homes, then the labor and the resource necessary to do that is greatly reduced because you've identified a way to complement those high touch services with a more scalable way of providing services. So um, no matter what we do, we're gonna always need to um, have that subsection of the population that you're going to need to outreach to. That doesn't end, but you do also need to complement that with being able to provide them services in a digital age, because quite honestly, it's, it's just as important to educate them and, and, and get them practice in engaging with the healthcare system in a digital format, because that's, where everything is headed, whether it be remote monitoring, whether it be um, the, the you know, uh, uh, Fitbits and everything else, that's the way that things are moving. And so part of, like Joe said, our goal is not to, we have no investment in making people better at being poor, right? And, that, and, and part of that means that you have to educate individuals and build a certain level of resilience in individuals where they don't need to rely on high touch services for the remainder of their lives. Um, or we also see this rebound effect where individuals get services, they get off services, then they get back on services and they just go back and forth and back and forth. You know, um, I use the example that, you know, we have, everyone has life challenges. Everyone does. But when I have a life challenge, I have an education and a salary and et cetera that I can use to buffer the magnitude and the scale of the challenge in my life. But if you do not have that, then it will set you back so far that you can never recover. That is that lack of resilience. And that's why our goal is not only to build resilience, but we are unique in our ability to track resilience. Most places you go to will only provide you social services and say, good, I've done all that I can do. Our goal is to provide, so to get you linked to social services, but then add a, a, an additional level or layer of services that are intent on educating you and moving you to a point where you have a greater buffer, right? Moving you to getting maybe that one more um, degree or that certification for a trade that can create that buffer that'll allow you to survive the next challenge that is placed in front of you in life. And so that's the, that's the, the, the strategy. I'm new with technology. Okay. Imagine working two or three jobs that doesn't give you any benefits and you need to go to the doctor. That means you got to make a choice of bringing in 20% less that week for your family where you can hardly afford to pay the rent. That means you have to pay whatever copay you need to pay. That means you have to pay for whatever labs or diagnostic testing was ordered. And then when it all comes back, you got to take another day off work go see the, uh, the provider, and then they'll give you a prescription that you hope you could pay for. Imagine having the technology that allows us to be able to follow these patients. How many, pay, how many young women in Medicaid do not get the appropriate prenatal care that they need? It's overwhelming because they don't have access to it. But the most important social determinant that we hope to mitigate is a social determinant of trust. People have to trust you. And at-risk communities tend not to trust anchor institutions because let's be honest about it. I'm a, I'm a professor. 
how was I brought up in my medical school and undergraduate? You'd go into these communities. I'd take your history. I'd take your blood. I'd take your tissue. And I'd publish. And what did we give them back? We gave them a day of a health fair. So we could tell them that they also had high blood pressure and hyperlipidemia. As opposed to building the trust and working with them and teaching a student how to build that trust so that when they speak with their, their patients and their patients' families, they can get across the importance of what they're trying to say. Imagine if we had this whole country in all the at-risk regions, a Genesis program where there's a gross mistrust for the medical system from both Hispanics and African-Americans because of history, the uh, vaccine trials in Guatemala, the Tuskegee experiments. Why would they wanna turn around and trust us? Well, we need to go in there and build that bridge. These are human lives that are at risk. And all of us that are physicians, we took an oath. The members of my, uh, our team that are not physicians, they didn't take an oath. These are real heroes. I'm obligated. But these are real heroes that have devoted their career to make this world better. And we want to start by doing that here in Vegas. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is a multi-part question. Uh, when you were in Florida yeah. um, and doing the Genesis program, how many years uh, did, it, did you do it? Um, uh, how many students um, were brought in specifically under that program with going and then graduated and then went on to go to residency. Uh, one of our problem, as you know, is our, uh, we lose so many medical students to residency programs outside of our state because our local residency programs are not their desired programs. We are working on improving our residency programs so they can compete with practices residencies outside. But if you keep that in mind, uh, how many in the, you know, we're hoping because like with UNLV, they're taking literally 100% of Nevada residents and hoping that they'll continue to stay in Nevada even after they go to residency outside and come back. So if you take that and extrapolate a little using the data you found in Florida on your students and the Genesis program, which seeks to really engage them in the community more. Are, we, are, what did you find? A lot of them came back after their residency. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit early right now to be able to say, but I'm telling you right now, the first generation students did come back. As, yes. And, and Karen might want to chime in on this. I mean, we did have a, a large percentage of our students that specifically wanted to stay in South Florida because they had so many familial ties to South Florida, but interspersed throughout the state, most of our students, I mean, I've had a student that did family medicine. He got accepted to Duke residency. He did not want to leave and go to Duke. Great program. He stayed at Jackson. How about our pediatrician that turned down? Options? She went and she's at Jackson. Family so they stay when there are residency programs. You've just got to have the residency programs because they are close to their families. They are they are immersed in the community. They live their lives in these communities their whole lives, and this is home to them. Um, I'm thinking, you know, uh, even, uh, the, you know, the, a couple that I had run into Valerie, at, I mean, at, they leave, they come back. They the always want to come back. She was at a very prestigious uh, OBGYN program. She was at a very prestigious OBGYN program. And she, what's the first thing she did? She took a job at an FQHC to serve Miami. And so th there's two aspects of that. One of them is the studies they do with GME. But nobody's looking at the studies of who do you bring in. No, because we're not a state school, and when you only have 500 applying in a year. Oh, the question is, are, are we going to insist on 100% Nevada to get in? That, that's generally a, a state school requirement. It's about 80%. We would like to have 100% Nevada students. That's why we have such a strong pipeline. That's what we want to do. And we're even talking about, and this was started before by Jeff Talbot, uh, is a master's program 
but get students and bring them in after their third year of college, get in a master's program, have the college also give them two degrees. Now they have two marketable degrees. At the same token in our master's program, we can prepare them for medical school, but we also have the advantage of a one, two year long internship. And we can prepare these students for that. The, and and that's, that's what our goal is. Our, our goal is we need more physicians here. That means not just in medical school, that means when they come back and practice. The, uh, I'm not discouraging you know, basic science research, but we need to produce clinicians. That's what we need in this country right now and in this re region. The other one is we got to recruit from here. That's who's going to stay. say that yeah i just wanted to say that there wasn't an option to be in the genesis version in in south florida every every student went through it you didn't have a choice and the same will exist here so so to your question of how many of them went through the program um it's as many students as came through the medical school and the same will apply here we, we, we did it for 14 years before we came here yeah yeah. My hair was black. There's 800 plus students at this point, I think. So, and we ended up after, I guess, a third year or something like that, or fourth year, we had 120 students. With us. Yeah, we went uh, 40, 40, 80, 120 was our class size progression there. Yes, ma'am. So interestingly, in the recent poster contest that uh, Clark County Medical Society had and uh, you uh, were able to see, uh, we had a, about 51 students participate. And one of those outstanding students did a presentation on um, intelligence and emotional IQ. And because a big issue today is medical student and physician burnout, they found that the students that had a better emotional IQ could had far less medical student burnout, suicide rates. And so did you find just empirically, although you may not have done the data, one of the concerns sometimes, and I think what they were all shocked to find out was that the flip was true, the reverse was true, that you think the students from low income, that they may not have been adequately prepared and been overwhelmed, uh, and yet, what they really found is they were probably under more stresses and were more resilient. I just think uh, that's so, it. I, I, I'd, I'd like to speak to that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Cheryl. I, I mean, there, there's a very, it, come, the, it comes down to very individual factors, right? And so when you're dealing with classes of say 100 students, you have 100 individual people and it's very hard to make those aggregations. We were using an emotional intelligence uh, tool in Florida with all of our students for them to use through a professional development class that allowed them to learn about themselves and learn about you know, what kinds of strengths um, that, that they had and what kinds of things that they could enhance through their medical school. And so that's, that's actually part of what we think of as part of the curriculum. I wanted to say something like that earlier too in the sort of left brain, right brain conversation as a psychiatrist, um, because it, it's, it's more complicated than that. And you find people who have math and science talents who are also enormously artistically talented and giving opportunities for that expression and even finding that expression can be something that can help people in times of stress. Right, so, so focusing on our student wellness is extremely, extremely important to us. And not only our student wellness, our faculty wellness as well, and staff wellness, that is, that's really critical and giving them the ability. I think, you know, if anything, residency is more stressful. Medical school tends to be a more protected environment than residency. Residency is really uh, considered the, you know, the time of the highest stress. Um, and so um, there, there's a lot that we can do to help our students um, really be prepared. You have to have a very robust student affairs office where wellness is a major Absolutely. Uh, aspect of what we're doing. And also start the discussion early. It's okay to be depressed. It's okay to be anxious. We have support services for you. And one of the things that we were starting off before we left was starting off the conversation that it's okay to talk about suicide because we know that there's a major issue, not just in medicine, but in the rest of this country and nobody talks about it. So it becomes, even when you look at, you know, uh, gun safety, 80% of all deaths by handguns are suicides. 
So these are serious issues we need to address in society. And this is where social accountability comes up. There's an issue going on in my country. There's an issue going on in my community. How do we, as a professional class, turn around, get together with those that are not also not professional class and say, how do we come to a solution? How do we make this better? And you said we had to wrap up? Okay, we have to wrap up because there's food. One, yes. When we apply for LCME accreditation, we're going to have 18 months before they come in and do uh, a uh, site visit. So you're looking, and because I'm not allowed to publicly declare when you can apply. So you're looking at a timeline of uh, anywhere from two and a half to four and a half years, something like that. And at the reception, I'll tell you the date. <laughs> you guys. Thank you so much for allowing us to uh, have this conversation with all of you and we're really looking forward to the future.